In this exciting sermon, we draw lessons from God's dealings with Israel in bringing them out of Egypt and into the promised land on what it takes to receive redemption blessings. You don't want to miss this message. All right, why don't we just rise up to our feet, make our declaration this morning. We're going to go straight in, make our declaration. So if you brought your Bible, I want you to please hold your Bible high up in the air. Say this out loud, bold, and strong. Let's do this together. This is God's Word. This is God speaking to me. I am what God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I am blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word, I believe His word, and I live by His word. Christ is my master, and to Him I am an absolute surrender. In Jesus' name, amen. Please turn around to people around you, in front of you, behind you, shake hands, give them a good smile, tell them you're happy to see them here this morning, and you may be seated, please. We're going to begin now just by reading a few verses of scripture that we read last Sunday as well. We're talking about receiving redemption blessings. So I want to just quickly review for a few moments and then take things forward from where we left last Sunday. So if you have your Bibles, you could follow along in your Bibles or you could look up at the screen. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. We'll read that first. Romans chapter 5 verse 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So Adam sinned, death came into this world and death passed on everyone. Because all have sinned. So that was our sad state. Death was over us. We were in subjection to death, sin, sickness, disease, Satan, his demons, and all of that. We were under. But here's the good news. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. We read these verses last Sunday. We'll read them again. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. Giving thanks to the Father... Who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. So tell your neighbor, I'm qualified, are you? <laughs> the Bible says giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He qualified us. So you don't need to write another exam. You don't need to pass another, you know, I don't get another degree. You are qualified for what? To partake of the inheritance of the saints in light. That is, God has an inheritance. We, would, we could use different terms. We could call them redemption blessings. We could call them benefits. God has inheritance for his people. And he has qualified you. To partake of that, to enjoy that, to enjoy your share of that inheritance. And then he continues in verse 13. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us, translated us, immigrated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So he took us out. He delivered us. From the power of darkness. The powers of darkness have no more dominion over you and me. And he has transferred us into the kingdom of his own dear son. In whom, verse 14, in whom we have redemption. So this is redemption. We have redemption. Through his blood. The forgiveness of our sins. 
One more verse which we saw last Sunday, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You were bought at a price. So you've been bought. You've been purchased. So you and I are now God's purchased possession. We are God's property. So let's say that boldly. I'm God's property. All of me belongs to God. See, when God bought you and me, he didn't say, okay, I'll buy their body and spirit and devil, you keep their soul. No, he bought our spirit, soul, and body. Totally, completely, fully, we are God's purchased possession. We are his property. The devil has no right, no claim, no hold over your life and mine. We belong to God. So therefore, Paul says, glorify God, glorify God. Let everything that happens in your spirit, soul, and body bring glory to God. Glorify God in your spirit, in your body, because they belong to God. So let God receive glory through everything that happens in your spirit, soul, and body. Amen? So God has done this work. He's brought us out of darkness. He's redeemed us. So we said last Sunday, everything that Adam put us under through the fall, Jesus, through the cross, he brought us out of. Amen? Whatever Adam did, he, whatever came in because of sin and of, of the fall, Jesus Christ delivered us. The, his work on the cross was complete. It was not partial. It was a finished work, complete work. He said, it is finished, it's done. So everything, Adam, everything that came upon us because of the fall, we were under. But now we are over. He's brought us out of it and he has set us over those things. Now we understand that an experience of that, experientially, some of that is here in the present. Some of that is over in the future. We, we spoke about that last Sunday. But the fact is, his work of redemption was complete. He didn't do 90%. He said, 10%, I'll come and finish it. No. Complete work of redemption. So the challenge for you and me is this. He has brought us into his kingdom. He's qualified us to partake of the inheritance of the saints. Question is, how do we partake? What do we need to do? How do we receive redemption blessings? I know it's a reality in the realm of the spirit. It's done. But in the natural realm, you and I are walking in this world. We have to contend with so many things. So in the day, in our daily life, what's it going to take for us to receive redemption? Blessings. That's what we are talking about in this series of messages. So what we want to do this morning is we want to start off with some clues in the Old Testament. When Joshua and Ruth were young, we had this video series called Blue's Clues. <laughs> I, know somebody, I don't know how many of you know that. So you had these little clues, and you follow the clues, and you find out something nice happened, you know, whatever. So the Old Testament has clues. Now, technically, we call them types and shadows. But if you just as a layman, there are clues in the Old Testament. <laughs> and they speak of a reality in the New Testament. So we want to look at a type and a shadow of redemption in the Old Testament. And one of, uh, one of those types and shadows in the Old Testament of redemption, the story of redemption, is God bringing his people out of Egypt into the land of promise. That is a type and a shadow of God's redemptive work. That's in the Old Testament. You and I, in the New Testament, we enjoy the reality of it. Right. So we're going to go back into the Old Testament and, and look at it and, and draw lessons. Now, let's read some scripture before we begin to do that. So let's go to Romans 15, verse 4. We're going to read quite a few passages and then we're going to just tie all this together. Romans chapter 15, verse 4. The Apostle Paul writes here in Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. 
Now, I didn't read the verse pre before this. In verse 3, he's really referring to the Old Testament scriptures, or what we call as the Old Testament. He's referring to this Old Testament scriptures. And he says, whatever was written before was written for our learning. So I have a question for you. You're a New Testament believer. Do you read the Old Testament? Should you? Or not? We do. Because Paul says, whatever was written before was written for our learning. So don't let anybody say, oh, don't read the Old Testament. Show them Romans 15, 4. <laughs> you know? Whatever was written before in the Old Testament was written for our learning. It's God. God's message for us today. And so we still read the Old Testament. We learn from it. We see what God has to say to us through the Old Testament. So let's look at some scripture here that talk about the type, the, the Old Testament type that talks to us about the story of redemption. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. We're going to read a few passages. So please bear with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Therefore, Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. So he's saying something here. He's going back to the Old Testament. He's going back to the time, uh, 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 just the, mo the day, the night. When God was about to deliver his people out of Egypt, they sacrificed the pa Passover lamb. And they took the blood of the lamb and applied it on the doorpost of the house. So they did that. And here Paul is saying, Christ our Passover. That lamb there was a type. It was a shadow. The reality is Jesus Christ. And Christ is our Passover. He is our Passover. So what they experience as a type and as a shadow, we get to enjoy the reality. Now, you know, maybe you're sitting where you are and you're walking out in the sun, you see a shadow. The shadow, you know, looking at a shadow, and I can see my shadow right here on the carpet, it only has some information can give you an outline. Okay, here's a man. He's holding a mic. <laughs> it doesn't tell you much more. It's a shadow. But the reality is much richer. So the Old Testament, they had the type. They had the shadow. You and I have the reality. It's much greater, much more richer than what they experienced. Amen? But the Passover is a type of Christ being crucified for us. That's representative of redemption. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 6. And just follow along. As they are leaving Egypt, they are making their way to their land of promise. What other types do we see? And this is the Holy Spirit pointing this to us. It's not you and me making it up. If you and I make it up, we call that allegory. I'm just making something up. But this is Holy Spirit given, so it's a biblical type. 1 Corinthians 10 verses 1 to 6. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, verse 2, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So what's the type we see here? After they came out of Egypt, redemption, Passover lamb, the next thing they encountered was the sea. They passed through the sea and they came under the cloud. And he's saying this, they were baptized into Moses. So passing through the sea and coming under the cloud is a type of baptism. Are you with me? It's, it's what Paul said. I'm not making it up. <laughs> Paul said, there they were baptized into Moses. Here you and I are baptized into Jesus, into Christ. So, redemption, baptism, baptized into Christ. Let's go on. Verse 3. And all ate the same spiritual food. Okay. 
What's he talking about? The manna and the quail. So as they made their journey through the wilderness to the promised land, God sent manna. God sent the quail. So they had manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for dinner. They had manna curry, manna, oh no, sorry, <laughs> quail curry, quail roast, all these. Uh, it was manna and quail, manna and quail. But Paul says, that is a type of our spiritual food. So as God is taking you and me into our land of promise, into a place, the land of promise, we'll talk more about that later. But as we're making this journey, he is giving us spiritual food. Revelation knowledge, the truth of his word that is nourishing us as we are making our journey. Are you with me? This is God giving that. He's doing that. So it's important for you and me to receive revelation knowledge. We need to receive a revelation of the word of God. Not just read it like, okay, it's you know, intellectually, okay, this is chapter and verse. But get the truth of that word. Get that revelation. What is God saying? It's important for us to receive revelation of that word. They had manna and quail, but Paul is saying it's a type of spiritual food. Then verse 4. And all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So what's he talking about? He's talking about water that came out of the rock. And he says that water is... Is, is, is what quenched the thirst. Spiritual drink. Water representing spiritual drink. The rock representing, come on, Christ. Paul says it. The rock represents Christ. The water that came of the rock. First time Moses had to strike it. Second time Moses spoke to it. So what does it mean to us as we are making our journey? God is meeting all our needs. That is, is, He's providing that drink for us to take, quench our thirst, to meet our need. And it is coming through the finished work of Christ on the cross. The rock was struck. Crucifixion. You, you and I only have to speak to the rock, meaning believe, receive. And every, all our needs are being satisfied. Met to the rock, the finished work of Christ on the cross. And then verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for the bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things became our example. See, once again, don't read this as a nice Old Testament story. Color the pages. No, it's for our learning, it became examples for us, is what Paul is saying. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 3. And we're going to read part of chapter 3 and part of chapter 4. Because the continuation of this type uh, we find there. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. Are you over with me so far? Hebrews 3, 16 to 19. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? So once again, he's looking back at God bringing his people out of Egypt. Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see... That they could not enter in because of unbelief. It's a question. What was one reason? That they could not enter their land of promise because of the um, because of their unbelief. Alright? Keep that in mind. Let's go to chapter 4, verse 1 onwards. Therefore. Since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us, so now he's talking to us, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. So now he's taking that and he's talking to us. It's a type. That's the type. 
We walk in the reality. It says, they could not enter because of unbelief. Make sure it doesn't happen to us. Verse 2. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. What was their unbelief? They didn't mix faith with the word they heard. That was unbelief. The same word was preached to them. That you can enter their, your land of promise. Same word. Same word is being preached to us. You can enter your land of promise. You can come into that place where you receive redemption blessings. You can come into that place. But the word preached to them didn't benefit them. Didn't do them any good. Why? They didn't mix faith with the word. That was unbelief. Are you with me? So we need to mix faith with the word of God. To enter in to our land of promise. Is what the, what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Verse 3. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. I want you to see something interesting here. He's saying that land of promise was a place of rest. But actually they had battles to fight. But he's calling it rest. A type of rest for us. But they had battles to fight. Now, why is it rest? Because he says, the works were already, God already finished the work. So even though they had to fight, they fought from a place of rest. So tell your neighbor, fight from a place of rest. Now, this sounds paradoxical, two opposites. How do you fight from a place of rest? Well, that's what he's saying. It's a rest because the works are finished. You and I don't need to do anything more. The work is completed. But yet I have to take the cities. I have to possess the land. I have to dispossess the enemy. So I fight, but I fight from a place of the finished work. From a place of rest. Are you with me? We continue there. Next verse. Verse 4. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it. And those to whom it was first preached did not enter. Because of. So what's the second reason? Second reason why they could not enter the land of promise. Because of? What was the first reason? Oh, don't forget. <laughs> so two reasons here. Why these people could not enter their land of promise. One, because of unbelief. They didn't mix faith with the word that was given to them. They didn't benefit them. Second, because of disobedience. Can you imagine these people? God is saying, I'm taking to a land of milk and honey. They say, God, we want the onions and garlics. Disobedience. We don't want to go in there, God. We want there. Disobedience. And they couldn't enter the land of promise. Verse 7. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for you and me to enter into that land of promise. For he who has rest, entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. So what does rest mean? You're seizing from your own works. You're you seize or you're not striving to possess with your own ability. That promised land is a place of rest. You seize from your own works. You operate out of the fact that God completed the work and God is also resting. So you see from your own works. The work is finished. You operate out of the finished work of Christ 
on the cross. Verse 11 once again brings, us the, uh, brings out that second reason. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. So, there are two things we see here. Two reasons why they could not enter the land of promise. One, because of unbelief. And two, because of? We keep that in mind. We have to learn. Right? He says all this is our ex examples for us. So, so now entering the land of promise for us is a type of entering our place of blessing. The reason God brought us out of Egypt is to take us into the land of promise. That's the reason. That's where you enjoy the milk and honey. You enjoy the blessings of God. The, the riches of the inheritance that he has given to the saints. You enjoy that. Uh, and that's where he, he wants us to live and dwell in. In the land of promise. It's a place of rest because we live out of the work that God has completed. He has finished his works. In fact, he did it even before the foundation of the world as we saw in verse 3. So let's get the full picture. Let's go back to Egypt. Starting with the redemption. Passover. So here, they were in Egypt slaves for 400 years. Slaves. But in one night, because of the Passover lamb, one night, in one night, they were delivered. They were redeemed. They were brought out of Egypt. That is a type of our redemption. But when God brought them out of Egypt, he just didn't bring them as slaves. Come on, guys, hurry up. You know, they're all running out to turn G, uh, turn. Torn shorts and shirts and running out of slaves. No. When they came out of Egypt. All that they had worked for. For 400 years. Which was in the hands of the Egyptians. In one night electronic transfer took place. <laughs> Everything was transferred. One night. So the Bible says in Psalm 105 verse 37, He brought them out with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. The type of our redemption. We were brought out of slavery and into the riches of God's own kingdom. Amen? Brought out of it. And brought into this spiritual inheritance that God gives to the saints who are in light. He didn't bring us out of poverty, so to speak, to keep us in poverty. He didn't bring us out of slavery to keep us enslaved. He brought us out with silver and gold. And there was the redemption blessings. And if you look at that type, there are, like we said last Sunday, there are blessings in the spiritual realm. There are blessings in the natural realm. All kinds. The Bible says, Ephesians 1, 3, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. Every blessing that God can give his people, he's given to us. Amen? The next thing, what happened? They came out of Egypt that night and they headed straight to the Red Sea. The Red Sea parted before them. They came under the cloud. What is that a type of? Guys, come on. It's okay to talk in church. At least here. <laughs> what is that a type of? Baptism. There, they were baptized into Moses. Here, you and I are baptized into Christ. So what has happened? When God redeemed us out of Egypt, he brought us into Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. We are spiritually one with him. We are baptized into Jesus. God has brought us in a union with Christ. We have been baptized into him. In Christ. What does that mean? What happened at the Red Sea? The moment they crossed over. The Egyptians who once enslaved them, held them captives. Their captors came in 
and they were all drowned, gone forever. So what has happened? Our former captors have no more claim over our lives. The devil has no more claim, or it's gone. You are in Christ. So that's how you and I can say, I've been bought with a price. I belong to God. The devil has no more right over me, no more claim over me, no more access into me, no more hold over me. I've crossed the Red Sea. You've crossed the Red Sea. You are in Christ. Those, or the horse and the rider fell into the, so you sing that Sunday school song, right? Gone. No more right over you. And now, the next thing. They are walking, journeying through the land of promise. And they have the cloud. They have the pillar of fire. God's leading, God's presence, God guiding them. I just want to read this little few verses here from Nehemiah 9. Nehemiah 9 also explains some of this to us. So let's go to Nehemiah 9, verse 19. It says, yet in your manifold mercies you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. So the, the cloud and the fire is talking about God's guidance. God leading, God showing. So, for you and me, as we are journeying, making our journey, God is leading us. God is guiding us. It's a type of the Holy Spirit. You read this uh, a little later. We'll read it in, in, in Nehemiah 9. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, where, where it talks about the Holy Spirit leading them. We'll come to that. But the next thing we see that happened as they were making the journey was the manna and the quail. What is manna and quail a type of for us? Let me hear you. One more, one more time, a little louder. Okay, good. Just to make sure you remember. So God is giving us spiritual food. Now you need spiritual food. There's no need to starve spiritually these days. The Bible is available for all of us. There are plenty of places where the word of God is being preached. Amen? Spiritual food. But you need to receive it and feed yourself with spiritual food. It's important. God's getting ready, getting you ready to go into the land of promise. You need to be fed spiritual food. The man and the quail. Revelation knowledge, the understanding of God's word. You need to be fed. It also talks about God's provision to take care of their needs. And then we, we have the rock and the water that flowed out of the rock that, that quenched uh, uh, their thirst. For us, it's talking about spiritual thirst, spiritual drink, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10. The rock, we know, is a type of Christ, meaning that as we are journeying, everything, all our needs are satisfied through the finished work of Christ on the cross. So we have to drink of that rock to tell a neighbor, drink. Really drink. <laughs> spiritual drink, that is you're receiving of the rock, Christ, receiving of his finished work. You drink it, you take it in, you receive it. We've got to drink. You're making your journey, receive uh, uh, everything Christ has provided for you and me through uh, his finished work on the cross. So now let's go to Nehemiah 9, 20 and 21. It kind of sums up all of this. Verse 20 and 21. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them. Hey, we only talk about here about the cloud and the pillar. But Nehemiah is interpreting it for us. You gave them your Holy Spirit to instruct them, to guide them. And you did not withhold your manna from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them. God sustaining them. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. That's amazing. God supernaturally took care of everything. They didn't have to go to, where do you normally go? So, or, or, they didn't have to go buy clothes for men. You know, I don't know where you go. Ladies go to social, wherever, you know, whatever. Okay. 
So they didn't have to go do all that. God took care of their clothes. Their clothes did not wear out. Their feet did not swell. Their sandals or shoes, well, they were everything. God supernaturally sustained them as they made their journeys. Talk about God taking care of all their needs because of the rock that followed them. So the rock follows us. The rock is Christ. But we know that we know they came all the way to the edge of the promised land, but they, because of unbelief, because of disobedience, they didn't enter in. They spent 40 years or close to 40 years just wandering around in the wilderness. But God still took care of them. You know, 40 years, he still provided for them. Still provided for them. So Nehemiah says, you know, in Nehemiah 9 and verse 17, he says, they refused to obey. They were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant kindness, and did not. Can you imagine? These people, God is saying, I want you to go to a land that, that I want to give you as an inheritance. I want you to go to a land that's flowing with milk and honey. I want you to take you to this land, a land of promise. And they're saying, God, we want to return to our bondage. But God was still merciful. And he still took care of them. Manna still kept coming. The quails still kept falling. And God said, until I get rid of this unbelief and this disobedience, I'm going to work with you. And it took almost 40 years to get rid of unbelief, to get rid of disobedience. So finally, they're at the edge of the promised land the second time now. And let's see what they did to enter in and then we will tie all this together. So, how did they enter the land of promise? First, they crossed over river Jordan. First thing they did. And now Joshua was in charge. He had them cross over river Jordan. Now, the Bible does not state this. But most Bible teachers would, believe, would, would, say, would interpret the crossing of the river Jordan as a baptism in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the first time they crossed over water, he said it's a type of baptism. But it was a baptism into their leader, into Moses. or For us, it is into Christ. So the second time we cross over Jordan, the Bible doesn't state it, but we infer, or we could state based on what we say, that this is a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you disagree, you don't want to believe that, that's fine. Nothing will change. But if you want to understand it that way, that is fine. It's a type of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next thing we do is we see them do in, in Joshua 5 is circumcision. Joshua says this whole generation, you need to get circumcised because they didn't do it during the wilderness. So we see them as they're getting ready to take the land of promise, they circumcise. Circumcision represents two things for us. It talks about our covenant with God as God established the covenant of Abraham. And secondly, as you see it in, in Colossians 2.11 and, and Romans 2.20 to 29, it's a sign of cleansing from sin or consecration. Consecrate yourselves. Are you with me? And then they had to fight. But they fought from a place of rest. They had to fight. They had to dispossess. They had to fight against enemies. But they fought from a place of rest. This was the only army that marched around the walls and the enemy got conquered. They just marched and they conquered the, the only army that did that. They fought from a place of rest. So, let's tie all of this together and we will conclude. So, wake your neighbor up. Say he's getting ready to finish. So, how do we receive redemption blessings? Looking at the type, we followed them along. What can we learn? How can you and I enter our land of promise? A place of rest. A place where we inherit what God wants to give to us. Number one. Get rid of unbelief. Or we put it in a positive way. You have to have faith in the word. Faith in the word. They couldn't enter because they didn't mix faith with the word. 
You see, you and I are given the word of God. God's word reveals things to us. We need to have faith in that word. Faith in that word. Second, come into obedience. What is obedience? Obedience is a willingness here in this context. It's a willingness to go in, not stay out. They wanted to go back to bondage instead of going into the land of promise. So you and I have to have that willingness, that readiness. That God, yes, I want to go in. Many of us don't want to go in. And God calls that disobedience. You and I should be willing. God, I want to live in my land of promise. I want to live in that place of redemptive blessings. I want to live in the land of of milk and honey that you're making available the place of rest obedience willingness to go wanting to go ready to go third they cross river jordan which is a type of the baptism of the holy spirit so you and i need the baptism of the holy spirit the empowering of the holy spirit in our lives we can't do this on our own we need the power of the holy spirit to help us Possess what God's given to us as redemptive blessings. Number four, we need to consecrate ourselves. Every part of my being, spirit, soul, and body, needs to be sanctified, set apart for God, consecrated to God. Because if I give the devil a foothold, that's an area I'm not going to enjoy the redemptive blessings of God. And it is not God's fault. It is my fault for giving the devil a foothold. Are you with me? We need to consecrate ourselves. Say, God, all of me belongs to all of you. And I am saying it. My spirit, my soul, my body, everything is consecrated to God. It's God's property. I'm sanctifying it. I'm keeping it up aside so that it will only be used for the glory of God. That I will glorify God in my spirit, soul, and body. The devil will not have any place, no access, no right. And I'm not going to give him any foothold. We've got to consecrate ourselves. And then number six, the number five. We fight to possess. So all day they came into the land of promise, they still had to fight. They had to fight against his enemies. And God said, I'm going to help you conquer uh, enemies that are great. I'm going to help you conquer enemies that are greater than you. Possess cities that are mightier than you. But I'll help you do it. But you've got to fight. But you fight from a place of? That means you fight because Jesus has already finished the work. So in the land of promise, there may be enemies, and we all may face different kinds of enemies. There may be enemies attacking your body, your mind, your life in different ways, whatever. The sickness or disease, failure, defeat, uh, lack, bondage, addictives, addictions, whatever. All the enemies that trouble us in the soul, the body, they come. But you've got to fight. But you fight from a place of rest. The work is finished. And one last thing, number six. Once they came into the land of promise, no more manna, no more quail. No more manna, no more quail. Now I know it represents spiritual food, but the, I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on another aspect of that. The manna and the quail just fell from heaven. They didn't have to do anything. Other just go take it. Now, when you're in the land of promise, you've got to eat off the land. It's milk and honey. God said, I cause you to eat of vineyards you haven't planted and enjoy drink of wells you haven't dug. I mean, there is plenty there. But now, it's not coming from heaven. You have to take it. And if you want to put it like this, and this may be a crude way to say it, you were a child then, everything was provided for you. Now you're an adult, do it yourself. Some of us may have experienced that in our early days of childhood or spiritual childhood. Things just happened for us. It just fell on us. Now you're into the land of promise and saying, God, it's hard. Can I have manna and quail? Sorry. There's milk and honey, but you get it yourself. There are vineyards you haven't planted, but you've got to go get it. There are wells you haven't dug, but you've got to go get it. 
it's not going to drop on you. That means you, as a mature person in Christ, because of your faith in God and you walking with God, we together fight together and we possess and eat of the land together. You do it yourself. No manna, no quail. It's a slight difference. Amen? But God wants us to live in the land of promise. Enjoy redemptive blessings. Walk in the reality of his redemption. Every area of your life, you can walk free from sin and addictions and things that enslave you. It's, it's, it's living in the land of promise. But here's what it takes. If you look at the type and draw lessons, this is what it takes for you and me to live in the land of promise. To live in redemption blessings. Amen? Let's stand to our feet, please. We're going to take some time to pray. We're going to just call our worship team up, please. And, and also, I'd like to call our life group leaders up, our ministry leaders up. We're going to take some time to pray and minister. If you need prayer, he just needs us to pray with you. Say, like, help me. I want to enjoy my redemption blessings. Maybe there's situations in life that you need prayer for and ministry for. We're going to close, and then we'll continue praying the others are dis can will be dismissed, so you don't have to wait. But we want to be able to minister to people who need to be ministered to. Uh, so whatever area of need you may have, you are welcome to come for prayer. Uh, as soon as we close, we'll, we'll let you know. And you can come and we'll have our life group leaders up here to pray with you, to pray and minister to you. But before we close, I just want to give an opportunity for people here this morning. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, I would like to give you an opportunity to do that. The whole reason that we believe in Jesus Christ, the whole, the whole purpose of all of this is because Jesus Christ should be Lord and Savior of our lives. The Bible tells us Jesus died for our sins on the cross. He was buried. The third day he rose again. He's alive today. And the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So there's anyone here this morning you never, up until this time, you never believed in Jesus or you never made a choice or decision to believe in Jesus Christ and let Him be your Lord, your Savior. I would like you to do that. If you feel a prompting inside, you're saying, yes, I want to do it. Then please pray this prayer with me. It's not the prayer that saves, but it's Jesus who saves. The prayer is only to help you call on Jesus, to express your intent and your desire to believe in Jesus Christ. If you've never done this before, would you play, pray, please pray this with me. Would you say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins and help me live for you the rest of my life. I believe you died on the cross. You were buried and that you rose up again the third day. Be my Lord and be my Savior. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Anyone, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. If you don't mind, could you just raise your hand? Anyone, you prayed this prayer with me for the very first time this morning. I just want to see your hand. If you don't mind, just raise your hand. Anyone up in the balcony? Anyone? Okay. I, I do not see any hands. But if you did pray that prayer with me this morning, on all of our exits, there will be people waiting with a, a red bag. So as you leave... Would you please tell them, I prayed this prayer this morning and I'd like to receive that bag. We have that bag for those people who pray, make their first time decision to believe in Jesus Christ. 
we have that bag available so on on the way out just tell them they'll take your name and number and give you that bag so that you can carry that with you so if you did that if you pray that prayer with me this morning please make sure you do that before you leave we're going to close and after that we're going to take some time to pray and minister for those who need prayer you need healing you need deliverance you need a, there's a situation that you want prayer for we're going to help each other to enjoy our redemptive blessings okay we are one we're fighting together we're fighting out of a place of rest sometimes we need each other in this battle so we'll be available our, our life group leaders will be available right up here just to pray with you pray minister to you and come expecting mix faith to the word that you heard jesus has finished that work that rock i want to drink of that rock the finished work of christ and i just want people to pray with me help me so please feel free to do that let's close please the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god our heavenly father and the sweet fellowship of his holy spirit be with each of us always in jesus name amen amen we trust that this message was a blessing to you we would love to hear from you you can email us at contact at abcwo.org. Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.